in the mid-1970s, I was a medical student in Perth, Western Australia. On the first day of our anatomy class, the lecturer said, the history of the human species is written on our bodies, and over the next year, you'll learn how to read that history. He paused a moment, then went on, we can't have you going out into the world like that crazy woman who pestered us at a conference a couple of years back. She thinks we came out of the water. After the required laughter had died down, he continued, not even a scientist, and there she was badgering a bunch of trained anatomists and evolutionary biologists with her theories of aquatic apes. That was the first time I heard the phrase, and for a quarter of a century, the last I thought of it. I came across it again a few years ago, and as an artist, the possibility seemed interesting enough, but I began to do a bit of reading about it. I'm not a proponent of the aquatic ape theory, as it's come to be called, but I'm not against it either. I'm certainly not trying to persuade you to believe it. I'm not trained as a scientist and have no qualifications to evaluate the technical arguments for and against. The biological details of the theory are fascinating enough, but the story behind the theory and what it tells us about the scientific community and the way that science responds to challenging ideas is at least as interesting. Here, in a nutshell, is the basic hypothesis. Ancestors of our species passed through a period of semi-aquatic existence before returning to a predominantly terrestrial lifestyle. This semi-aquatic interval was long enough for us to develop various adaptations which account for some of the very substantial differences between today's humans and their closest living relatives, the apes. If you think this is far-fetched, you're not alone. Most of the world's evolutionary scientists would agree with you. Chimpanzees and humans share roughly 98.6% of their DNA. We're more closely related than, say, zebras and horses, or chimpanzees and gorillas. But it doesn't take an anthropology degree to see that there are some major differences to be explained, especially if we and our closest living relatives are supposed to have evolved more or less side by side on the African savanna. For example, why among 250 living primate species are we the only one without fur? Why are we the only truly bipedal primate? Why are our brains more than double the size of our closest relative? Why are we the only primate to sweat? And why are we so fat compared to all other primates? Why are we the only apes to like water, and among the only mammals with conscious breath control? These are just a few of the questions the aquatic ape theory attempts to explain, but the list goes on and on. Humans and apes were thought until the late 1960s to have diverged from a common ancestor between 10 to 30 million years ago. But in 1967, the biochemist Alan Wilson and his PhD student Vincent Sarich announced a technique to analyze the rate of genetic mutation. They showed that genetic mutations occur in the DNA of all species at a roughly constant rate, in effect providing a molecular clock. If you compare the differences in DNA between two species, you can determine approximately how long ago they last shared a common ancestor. Based on comparisons of our DNA with that of chimpanzees, Wilson and Sarich said that it was no more than five million years since humans and chimpanzees had split. Absurd, said the paleontological community, far too recent. But by the mid-1980s, independent data had confirmed Wilson and Sarich's date. The aquatic ape theory is most widely associated with a woman named Elaine Morgan. She's the crazy woman referred to by my anatomy lecturer. But the theory didn't originate with her. Its earliest recorded origins go back to a Greek philosopher named Anaximander in 550 BC. The first modern scientist to consider the idea was an Oxford-educated marine biologist named Alistair Clavering Hardy. As a young man, Hardy was appointed zoologist on the last British discovery expedition to the Antarctic in 1925. His assignment was to study the relationship between whales and zooplankton. 
and he became very familiar with the anatomy of marine mammals. In 1930, back at Oxford, he was reading a book called Man's Place Among Mammals by a famous anatomist of the day, Frederick Wood Jones. Wood Jones noted, but could not explain why, subcutaneous fat in humans pulls away with the skin, whereas with almost all terrestrial mammals, it does not. In a moment of epiphany, a word I use very deliberately in connection with Alistair Hardy, Hardy said to himself, I know why, it's blubber. As a young marine biologist with no training in primate evolution, he knew very well what would happen to his career if he began spouting ideas about aquatic adaptations in humans. So he said and wrote nothing public about his theory, but continued to research and develop the idea in private. This wasn't the only obsession he kept secret, but more of that in a moment. Another scientist, an elderly professor of pathology at Berlin University named Max Westenhofer, later had the same idea and was brave enough to publish it in a book titled Der Eigenweg des Menschen, The Road to Man. Unfortunately for the theory, Westenhofer retained his academic position under the Nazis, publishing his ideas in 1942 in German, in Germany. Equally unfortunately, he had publicly stated at a scientific conference before the war that he believed monkeys were descended from degenerate humans. His chapter on aquatic influences on human evolution were roundly ignored by the entire world. In fact, the only place I could find any information about Westenhofer's theories in English was in the Journal of Eugenics. By 1960, Alistair Hardy had achieved everything an ambitious scientist could hope for. Since 1945, he'd been professor of zoology at Oxford University. In 1957, he was knighted for his contributions to science, and he was world famous in his field. He decided it was finally safe for him to publicly announce his theory, but still he was cautious he decided to test drive the idea at a private gathering of non-scientists. On March 5th, 1960, this renowned marine biologist addressed a group of enthusiasts in the brand new sport of scuba diving, who called themselves the British Sub-Aqua Club. In that context, his lecture title, Aquatic Man, Past, Present and Future, may have been somewhat misleading. After he outlined his ideas about man's aquatic heritage, there was such an outcry, both at the club and in the popular press, that Hardy was compelled to write up his theory in a more scientific journal, The New Scientist. A couple of noted scientists wrote encouraging letters to the journal, but otherwise the entire scientific community responded with damning silence. Within a year, Hardy had retired from his position at Oxford University. He spent the next 20 years, until his death, researching his other obsession, also kept private since his youth on religious epiphanies, telepathy, and the relationship between them. The Alistair Hardy Trust continues his interest in these subjects today. The next time an established scientist published anything related to the aquatic ape theory was in 1967, when Desmond Morris referred obliquely to it in his best-selling book, The Naked Ape. But the contemporary story of the aquatic ape theory really begins in 1970, when Elaine Morgan read The Naked Ape. She was born in 1920 to a desperately poor family of coal miners in the Welsh town of Pontypridd, whose most famous native son is that singer of unforgivable songs from the 1960s, Tom Jones. Elaine's parents were determined that she would not follow in their footsteps. She was encouraged in her schoolwork, and her mother, wanting her to understand that women could make other choices, forbade her to help around the house. She won a highly competitive scholarship to Oxford University, and when she arrived at the Women's College, where she was to study and reside, it was assumed from her thick Welsh accent that she was the new cleaner. By 1950, she was living in a remote rural cottage, with neither electricity nor running water. She was married to a schoolteacher and had two small children. For the first time in her life, she had to cook and clean, which, to use her own words, didn't come naturally. Her son later commented that he grew up thinking all food was brown. After winning a newspaper story writing competition, she was hired by the BBC as a scriptwriter for that new medium, television. Over the next 25 years, My Anatomy Professor's Crazy Woman went on to win many awards for screenwriting, including two BAFTAs and two Writers Guild Awards. Long before the aquatic ape surfaced in Elaine Morgan's life, 
She was well-educated, articulate, and internationally successful in her field. She'd shown herself to be a woman of considerable intelligence and determination, and she was also an ardent feminist at a time when the word was only just coming into currency. It was with a feminist's eyes, then, that she read Desmond Morris's The Naked Ape, and was astonished to discover that human evolution had been determined by Man the Mighty Hunter, who learned to stand on two legs so that he could wield his spear while running after prey. Man, she read, lost his body hair to keep him cool while hunting. Man developed breath control in order to be able to speak so that hunting strategies could be discussed. Man tossed a few lumps of meat to the most sexually desirable females, and females responded by developing rounded breasts that resembled the fleshy buttocks that males had so enjoyed for eons past. This, according to Desmond Morris, was an inducement to face-to-face -face mating which would cement the pair bond and thereby keep the mighty hunter coming back to look after his offspring. To Elaine, this didn't seem entirely plausible. Reading around the subject, she discovered Hardy's forgotten article from a decade earlier. It seemed a far more likely account to her. She used her BBC credentials to attend scientific conferences on human evolution, where she began asking unwelcome questions about Hardy's theory. She wrote to Sir Alistair Hardy, now 80 years old, and said she'd like to write a book about his theory. Hardy wrote back, informing her that he soon intended to write a book on the subject himself. Then, recalling the resounding silence with which the scientific world had greeted his theory, he wrote to her again, saying he'd been advised it might be better if someone less well-known wrote a book on the subject first. So Elaine Morgan wrote the book she wanted to read. It was published in 1972 and was titled The Descent of Woman, in parody of Darwin's book The Descent of Man she made fun of the male-centric view of evolution and suggested that human evolution was driven not by one sex but by two. She accused the male-dominated scientific world of commandeering the topic of human evolution and ignoring the role of women as anything other than bipedal incubators. She also elaborated the aquatic ape theory, suggesting that its version of human development was at least as credible as the prevailing savanna theory. The book was an immediate bestseller. The newspapers were full of the story of the feminist housewife who had stormed the bastions of the male scientific establishment. With all this publicity, you might think that the scientific establishment would be forced to respond to the aquatic ape theory, but once again the idea met with icy silence. The scientific press simply ignored it. Elaine assumed it was because the scientific specialists knew things about evolution that she didn't, and found the aquatic ape theory too banal to waste words on. But she soon realized that, actually, they had no scientific explanation for why the theory was wrong. They dismissed her and her lack of specialist credentials, of course, but they had almost no arguments to counter the idea itself. Morgan claimed the aquatic ape theory was rejected for reasons that had nothing to do with its ability to explain human origins. Old academics, she said, were protecting careers which were based on a competing theory, the predominantly male research world was sexist and anti-feminist in their dismissal of the theory, and her status as a non-academic intruding on academic debates was considered totally unacceptable. As far as I can tell, the aquatic ape theory has relatively little hard evidence to support it, but then the prevailing theory, the theory currently adopted by scientific orthodoxy that we evolved on the dry grasslands of Africa, has equally little. Supporters of each theory point to the same evidence, the same fossil or the same geological or anatomical feature, and interpret it to suit their own ends.